guess that the threat of almost total destruction hangs over Idlib. While politicians talk and soldiers maneuver, life goes on there much as before. Many schools, shops and cafes are open and even the local football stadium is back in action. This corner of northwest Syria is the rebels' last major stronghold, but this fact hasn't dampened the people's rebellious spirit. Demonstrations like this one against the Assad regime have been held every Friday since last month's ceasefire deal. We all want Bashar to go. Listen to the voice of the people. Before the Russia-Turkey agreement, few schools in Idlib dared open their doors due to the threat of airstrikes. Hello? No. But now, more than 100 10 to 12-year-olds are at this one alone in Idlib city. Nowadays, it's safety to come to the school. Before that, it's really difficult to come to the schools, but nowadays, it's better than. They are very worried today. They hate this battle and we think that we will be in danger if the agreement uh, fails and if the air strike come again and if the bombs come again. So we will be in really dangerous. People in Idlib know all too well what war means. Many were evacuated from other former rebel-held areas, like Homs, eastern Aleppo, Dreya, and eastern Ghouta. Each starved and battered into submission. For that reason, many businesses shut their doors and people fled early last month, when it looked like history was about to repeat itself. Then, mid last month, came the ceasefire that few were expecting. The market, for example, is back on its feet and people have started buying and selling again. They are no longer cautiously saving their money in case they have to flee this area. President Assad hasn't been the only target of the weekly demos here. The powerful armed Islamist group Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, or HTS, which grew out of the al-Qaeda-linked al-Nusra front, is another. Many resent its intolerant and sometimes very violent tactics. Take the experience of this man. Late last month, masked members of its militia stormed into his home, put him in a van and then threw him into a small airless room. I was blindfolded, strapped to a torture wheel and then beaten inhumanely. They made me lie flat on my stomach then lifted my feet up in the air from behind, tied my arms and legs, and started beating my feet with a metal bar. Happily, Abdul was released several days later after protests from his community. And such anger against HTS, Dr. Rani Akeza told me via Skype, is not confined to Abdul's area. Everybody has something against them now. They have hurt each and every one here in one way or another. We do not agree with their ideology. We don't want to practice their ideology, nor will we let their ideology be spread. Many fear that HTS might refuse to remove its fighters and heavy weapons from the buffer zone as demanded by the ceasefire deal. Turkish forces would then have the task of changing their minds. Failure could mean utter destruction. But it's a fate that Dr. Kayser says many are willing to face if they have to. We are going to continue. So long there is a person that stays alive in this area, someone will scream out for freedom and dignity. That is a promise that I give on behalf of the entire Syrian people. With an eye on the devastation that followed previous ceasefires, 
local medics are preparing for the worst. Faced with a shortage of doctors, medicines and medical equipment, it's a very frightening task. We will be faced with an unprecedented disaster. If people aren't killed instantly from bombing, they will die from the lack of any available medical care. With the lives of around a million children at risk, along with a further two million adults, the stakes couldn't be higher. But for the moment, there's little most civilians can do but watch, wait, and hope. <laughs>